Boy, this toy car really travels, Tech. My nephew's going to get a kick out of it. <clears throat> Look, fellas, fun's fun, I know. But your nephew isn't going to like his Uncle Oliver if he gets a used toy instead of a new one. So why don't you put that away? Uh, um, on second thought, let me have it a second. Swell, Pete. You going to play with it? Ah, you know better, Tech. I can use this toy to help explain differential action to Ollie, so he'll understand the new Sure Grip unit. The differential? What's this toy got to do with that? It's a good example of why a car needs a differential, Ollie. Uh, wasn't that your idea, Pete? Right. You both know this toy car runs only in a straight line. The front axle doesn't turn. Also, both rear wheels are rigidly attached to the same shaft. When one turns, the other has to turn. That wouldn't do for an automobile. A single rear axle shaft would cause one rear wheel to slide instead of roll on curves or uneven spots in the road. On a curve, the outer wheel travels farther and faster than the inner wheel. On a bump or dip, one rear wheel does the same thing compared with the wheel that's rolling level. And that's really why the differential was invented, huh? Yep. Each rear wheel had to turn independently. So the single rear axle shaft was cut in two. Then the differential assembly was put in between the axle shafts. We're talking about the conventional differential, of course. Well, that I can follow. But exactly what the differential does and how, well, I don't know. Well, a conventional differential lets the rear wheels turn at different speeds while it divides the torque equally between the two wheels. It divides that torque equally? That it does, Ollie. And once we talk about the differential parts involved and what they do, you'll see how that torque is equally divided. Keep talking, Pete. I'm all ears. OK. You know there are two side gears. And you know that the inner splined ends of the axle shafts fit in these side gears. The wheels are on the outer ends of the shafts. If you mean one side gear rotates with the right wheel, and the other with the left wheel, well, that I do know. Good. Now, surrounding those side gears is a cast housing called the differential case. Pressed into the case is a small differential pinion shaft. Mounted on this pinion shaft are two smaller gears called differential pinions. These pinions are free to rotate on the pinion shaft, which is held stationary in the differential case. The side gears, of course, are located so that both of them mesh with the pinions. Still with me? Yep, I'm with you all the way. All right. Now, the axle drive gear is bolted securely to the differential case, so the gear torque passes directly to the case. Since the differential pinion shaft is pinned in the case, the torque is taken by the pinion shaft and applied to the bores of the differential pinions as a force. OK. I can still follow that. Here's an important point, Ali. Remember that each pinion is like a balance pivoted about its center. Here, I'll show you. If you put one weight on one tooth on this side and the same weight on an opposite tooth on the other side, the pinion would balance the weights like a small scale. Good point, Tech, and it makes one thing very clear. The pinions have to apply the same force to both side gears. The pinions cannot apply more force to the teeth of one side gear than they can to the other. As a result, Torque is divided equally between the right and left wheels. Uh-huh. I think I see what you're getting at. But uh, maybe a couple of examples would help. OK. You know that the case turns with the axle drive gear when it's driven around by the drive pinion. The drive gear and case go around at the same speed and with the same torque. So if a car were going straight ahead on a smooth road, the rear wheels would turn at the same speed, right? Yeah, yeah. Same speed. Good. You know then that when engine torque drives that drive gear around, the case turns with it and carries the pinions around. Since both rear wheels turn at the same speed, 
The gears and pinions inside the case don't turn on each other. Uh, said another way, Ollie, the pinions don't turn on their own shaft. They're in balance. They act as balance wheels, pivoted about the center and apply equal force to the side gears. Side gears, then, turn at the same speed as the case. The whole nest of gears turns like one solid unit. You get the same motion as you would get with a solid rear axle. I understand. But what happens when the rear wheels turn differently? One faster than the other, like when the car goes around a corner? Well, the inside wheel travels less distance than the outside wheel. Because of that, the side gear on the inside shaft turns slower than the differential case. This, in turn, makes the pinions turn on their own shaft. They roll around the slower moving side gear. Therefore, they allow the rear wheels to turn at different speeds, while still keeping torque evenly divided. Oh, I get the action. Now, let me ask one more question. What happens to all the torque when the car stands still? One wheel on ice, the other on dry pavement. Now, you start up, but don't move, because the wheel on ice just spins away. Well, when one wheel spins, the case still turns with the drive gear carrying the pinions around. But the total torque decreases, and the opposite wheel stands still because there's not enough torque to move the car. You see, the pinions still continue to divide torque equally between the right and left rear wheels. That's always going on. Now, because the ice is slippery, it takes less torque to turn the wheel that's on the ice. So the wheel standing on dry pavement can't get any more torque than the spinning wheel because of the equal torque division. And the car doesn't move. Look at it this way, Ali. You know that torque is twisting effort. Put a torque wrench on a bolt and tighten it until you get a reading of 40. What's that? Why, 40 foot-pounds of torque, or twisting effort, I suppose. Right. And it took effort because the bolt resisted turning. But if the bolt were broken, so the wrench began to spin around, would you be exerting more torque or less torque? Why, less torque, of course. Right again. And that's what happens when a wheel loses traction. Torque decreases there. And at the other wheel, because of the equal torque division the differential makes. Speed increases, but not the torque. In fact, when one wheel stands still, the rotating side gear turns twice as fast as the differential case. Twice as fast, huh? Yep. With one wheel still, the pinions have to turn on their shaft. Since they're in mesh with the side gears, they just run around the stationary gear. The side gear on the spinning axle turns faster because the pinions are turning on their shaft. The extra speed of the pinions is added to the side gear in addition to the speed of the case. Like Pete said, Ali, when one wheel stands still, the free axle of the wheel with no traction turns exactly twice as fast as it would when both wheels have the same traction. I think I understand it now. When one wheel loses traction, there's a gain in speed but a loss in torque. The good traction wheel doesn't get enough torque and the car doesn't move. Exactly, Ali. That's why Pete and I are so steamed up about the new Sure Grip Differential. It eliminates waste of torque that can take place when traction is unequal. Instead, the Sure Grip Differential redirects unusable torque from the wheel with poor traction to the wheel which has the better traction. By making use of torque that a conventional differential would waste in spinning, the sure grip unit enables the car to pull out of its difficulty. Sounds like a big improvement. It's big news, Ali. If somebody will turn this record over, we'll tell you all about it. Just how does the sure grip differential differ from the conventional unit, Pete? Let me show you, Ollie. I've got one ready to take apart. Notice that the case and pinion shafts have index marks for proper reassembly. As you can see, the case is made in two halves held by specially hardened bolts. When you take one half section off, you see one of the two packs of five clutch plates. Another pack is on the bottom of this assembly. 
External tangs on three of the clutch plates fit into slots in the differential case. The other two clutch plates have internal teeth which engage external splines in the pinion thrust member. Uh-huh. Then the clutching is done between the pinion thrust member and the differential case, huh? That's right. And the differential side gear, like the side gear in a conventional unit, is right under the thrust member. When you lift the side gear off, you see four differential pinions. They're on two pinion shafts connected loosely at right angles to each other with an axle shaft thrust spacer. Hmm. Twice as many pinions. Yep. And both ends of each pinion shaft have two flat surfaces or V-shaped ramps. These mate with identical ramps in the two half sections of the case. When we put this unit back together, you'll notice there's clearance at that point to allow for a slight sidewise movement of the pinion shafts. The axle shaft thrust spacer, which connects the two pinion shafts, is a two-piece deal fastened with a split hollow lock pin. That also permits sidewise movement of the pinion shafts. From here on, there's another differential gear, pinion thrust member, and clutch pack. Just the reverse of the parts on the other side. I see. Well, these sure grip parts are certainly different. How does this new differential operate? It works like the conventional differential under normal conditions, Ollie. But when the rear wheels turn at different speeds, it does this. Instead of dividing torque equally between the two wheels, the sure grip differential sends the greater share of torque to the slower moving wheel. If our car were standing still, for example, one wheel on ice, the other on dry pavement, and you start up, here's what takes place inside the sure grip unit. Drive gear torque in the differential case causes the pinion shafts to climb the case ramps and the pinion shafts separate. The pinions on these separating shafts have machine diameters which roll against the pinion thrust members and exert pressure. That compresses the clutches. Do both those clutches engage at the same time? Yes, indeed, Ali. In fact, any time there is torque applied to the sure grip, the clutches are engaged to some degree. The differential action itself doesn't actuate the clutches. I see. Okay, the clutches are engaged. Then what? Well, the axle shaft of the wheel with no traction can't spin because it has the clutch opposing it. So most of the torque going to that side is rerouted through the differential case and through the clutch on the other side to the axle shaft that's driving the slower moving wheel. That wheel has the better traction. Therefore, the car moves out of its difficulty. Uh-huh. Then the clutches help send the greater amount of torque to the wheel that can use it to move the car. Right, Ali. Now, when the car is making a turn, a slight amount of clutch slippage occurs. This limited slippage is equal in each pack. As a result, Differential action takes place and lets the outer wheel on the turn travel a greater distance at a faster speed. Yeah, and Ollie, if one wheel on that turn should hit loose gravel or ice and try to spin, sure grip won't let it. Instead, sure grip quickly provides resistance to prevent excessive one wheel speed up and keeps the car under control. Boy, no wonder you and Tech are so high on the sure grip differential. It's bound to add driving satisfaction, Ollie, as long as we see that only sure grip hypoid lubricant is used to lubricate the unit and that clearances are up to specifications. Cars equipped with sure grip have the letter S stamped on the gear ratio pad. Later on, cars may have a metal tag attached to a carrier bolt. And that means use only sure grip hypoid lubricant. Okay. Any other tips? Yep to check four possible conditions, a chatter, knock, growl, or failure of the sure grip unit to work properly, there's a definite service sequence to follow. First, remove the lubricant and refill with the right amount of sure grip hypoid lubricant. 
road test the car to see if proper lubrication corrects the condition. And if proper lubrication isn't the answer? Then use an approved puller to pull the wheels. Check axle shaft end play. It should be 13 to 18 thousandths. Again, road test the car. If you still have the condition, your third step is to pull the wheels, remove the differential, and clean off the lubricant. Okay, Pete, will do. I suppose I disassemble the unit next. No, not yet you don't. <laughs> Tell him, Pete. Your fourth step is to use two sets of feeler gauges to see that there's no more than 20 thousandths total clutch plate clearance. That shows amount of wear or may indicate improper plate assembly. First, slide in, say, a four thousandths feeler at the same time between the ends of the same pinion shaft and opposite sides of the V-shaped ramp. Next, step up the thickness until you get the total clearance. Invert the unit and check the other pinion shaft the same way. But while you're at it, Ollie, be sure there's not more than five thousandths variation in clearance from one pinion shaft end to the other. Okay. Now, suppose I find more than the twenty thousandths. Then remove the eight case bolts and disassemble the unit. Note the number of clutch plates and see if the thin tang plate was next to the differential case. In addition, see if the tanged and internal tooth plates were in alternate positions. Clean and dry all parts for close inspection. I see. Look for where? Right. Scored surfaces mean plates are worn. A surface plate check will show up any distortion. Discard any worn or distorted plates. After that, check the thrust spacer securing the pinion shafts. If the spacer's worn or chipped, use a small punch to drive out the lock pin and replace the spacer. Besides that, check thrust surfaces on the differential pinions and pinion thrust members for excessive wear. Look for brunelled or scored surfaces and replace any parts excessively worn. Replace any part unsatisfactory, huh? That's the idea. And when you reassemble the unit, oil the clutch plates with Sure Grip Hypoid Lubricant. The thin 1 16th plate with external tang goes next to the case. I see. And follow that with an internal tooth plate. Alternate for five in all. Three with tangs, two with internal teeth, and the thin plate is the outer plate. boy. Now, two more assembly tips. When you button up the pinion shafts, drive in the lock pin until it shows at, but not beyond the thrust face. That thrust spacer should be a loose fit. I see. So they can let the shafts separate. Right and line up the index marks on those shafts and on the case. An even 40 foot-pounds torque is what you need on the case bolts. I gotcha. Then, should I check total clutch plate clearance again? Always do that before you reinstall the differential in the carrier, Ollie. Make it a must. All right. That's very clear. Now, any other suggestions? Yeah. Don't spin the rear wheel when it's up on a jack unless you block the other wheel. Otherwise, the clutches might engage and move the car off the jack. Uh-oh. I'll watch out for that. There is some more sure grip information in this reference book, Ali. Like tips on assembly, for instance. Good enough, Tech. I'll give that book a careful reading. boy. Now, why don't you and all of our technicians take a closer look at this new sure grip differential? Try some of these checks today and get ready to give it your top flight attention. Thank you.